Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the session on 2BC201 Christian History and Missions. Even before we could begin with our session, can I request one of us to lead us in prayer? Paul, would you like to pray? Yes, let's humble ourselves and pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we worship you, we adore you, and I lift your name so high. We thank you for yet another day that you are going to listen to your word. Father, as we listen to your word, let your word bear fruit in us. Give us wisdom to understand what is going to be taught. We pray that let your Holy Spirit come and guide us. We pray also let our network be stable. We pray and declare all this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Paul, for leading us into a time of prayer. Um, so as per last week's schedule, let's, uh, let me uh, share the presentation so we will know whose turn it is for today. Give me a minute, please, while I share the presentation. Um, here we go. Okay. Okay, so lastly, we completed with John Knox, and today we can start with John Elliot. John, Paul, are you ready? Uh, yes, sir. Okay, okay, so you can, yeah, you can, uh, I'll stop presenting. You can share your presentation if you have prepared one. Yes. You have a sure. presentation? Sure. Thanks. Yes. Um, I hope you can see the screen. Yes, yes, it's clear. Oh, okay, thank you, thank you. All right, so good morning, everyone. Um, good to see all of you. Um, so this morning, we will uh, talk about a little bit about uh, one of the uh, famous missionaries in the 17th century, that is uh, John Eliot. So John Eliot was uh, instrumental in uh, a lot of publication work with regard to uh, the Bible. And this is in the 17th century, which where it started the Puritan movement, uh, where it talks mostly about uh, uh, purity in a uh, Christian circle. And uh, this is the way when the Lord uh, continued to change the attitude and uh, you know, started revival among the Christians, uh, among the believers. And one of the movements which really challenged the movement was Puritan movement, where it talked more about sanctification and purity from the traditional uh, uh, monarchical way of Christian life. Uh, uh, the the time because uh, over the course of time, when all the um, uh, what do you say misbeliefs started coming in Christian church, and uh, God had started His way to refine the church and make the bride that He wants. So uh, this 17th century, this season was the season of Puritan movement and John Eliot was a Puritan missionary. All right, so um, I'll just walk you through the uh, slides and how we uh, try to understand uh, his way uh, of ministering. Uh, okay, so we'll just see that through uh, this small presentation. Uh, so he was mainly ministering to American Indians. Uh, basically, he was from England. Uh, he was born in Hertfordshire in England in 1604. Uh, but uh, after his graduation in 1622, he graduated from Cambridge. And after that, he migrated to Boston in 1631. So uh, he was the first missionary to produce printed publications. So till that time, everything was uh, uh, communicated in verbally, uh, communicated 
uh, vocally. So he was instrumental in uh, sharing printed publication and he took effort for that. So this happens in uh, uh, 1604, especially among American Indians. So he, some called him the apostle to the Indians because he ministered uh, throughout his life, he ministered to American Indians. So in 1631, he migrated to Boston. It's also known as Massachusetts Bay. Um, he, he came there and he started um, working with the church. Okay, so here you could see a picture of the church, which is right now. Uh, so this church is the first church of Roxbury. So he ministered there um, uh, 40 years as a pastor, totally of 60 years. And um, from 1632, uh, he was the pastor and teaching elder of this church. So along with pastoring this church, he also ministered to people uh, across uh, that region, and especially to American Indians. So in the year 1640, he and his fellow ministers translated Sands, the book of Sands, into what they call as Bay Sam book. And this is the picture of uh, one of the uh, prints that they had. So uh, as I'm not sure if you could uh, read it. So it is a little different from the, uh, the English that we use, especially when you see the spelling of the word book. It is B-O-O-K-E and Sam's P-S-A-L-M-E-S. So it's a little extra spellings here and there. So it's a, it's a traditional English uh, which they followed. So what uh, they did was they um, sat and they uh, translated Sam's uh, uh, and they call it as the Sam book. It is also now available in uh, certain museums, right? And it was uh, given to British North American colonies and so that they could be encouraged in the world. So it was first printed in 1640. And after that, he was also instrumental in uh, making a school because he wanted uh, people to know uh, about the literature. And also he wanted people to know the word by reading and understanding. So he started a school and even now it is present. Uh, it's called Roxbury Latin School. And it is the oldest independent school in continuous existence in North America. So this is the present picture, uh, looks like uh, from the last year um, of the Roxbury Latin School near to 400 years now. And um, it, it is even thriving even now, and it's a great impact that he could make to the society. So this happened in 1645. In 1646, he began preaching to Native Americans in their own language. So one of the main challenge uh, what he had was the language because the Massachusetts language was very challenging for him. He had to learn it. So he, he learned it with the help of an Indian there. And um, so he learned it. He tried to preach once in 1646 and it was a disaster. Uh, they, they said they could not take it. They could not understand anything. And after that, he worked again so hard to learn the language so well and then um, he learned that it so well and he, he started translating that into their own language. So Massachusetts language is also a part of uh, Algonquin language. Um, so some of when you try to read about John Elliot, sometimes you see uh, Algonquin language. I don't know how to pronounce it, but I think it's like that. Um, so he started uh, translating it. He started getting that to people. And by 1674, he started, uh, 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 he, he was able to create uh, 14 towns with 4,000 believers. So uh, I'll just show you a picture. So this is what a pictorial representation of a town looks like um, in, in the Massachusetts Bay Area. So what happened was, so he started ministering to people and um, uh, many people came to know the Lord and uh, so just to give a little bit uh, more information there. So in 1646, when he gave uh, the first preaching, they all said it was not understandable. You know, they were not able to get what he is trying to say, but he went back and learned. And he gave the next preach, the next speech uh, in the same year. And one uh, person called Waban uh, came to know the Lord. And Waban helped um, 
John Elliott to uh, establish a community of believers. And this community of believers were known as praying Indians because his ministry was mostly among American Indians there. So once People started knowing the Lord. Uh, they started uh, a town, a small uh, town there. So it kind of looks like this is a pictorial representation as a, um, of how it looks. Oh, uh, he started it by uh, 46 and uh, towards uh, 51, they formed a town. And uh, the first one, as you can see here, is known as Natick. Okay, so by 74 in six by 1674 he was able to establish near to 14 such towns and with 4000 believers and not a lot of people came to know the lord understand the lord understand the literature um, by what uh, he, uh, his work was among his people um and he started translating the entire bible um, and he was able to bring uh, that out by 1663. And it is uh, the first printed Bible in North America. Okay, so uh, uh, if you are able to read uh, this part, this is the name of the Bible uh, which they had. And this is the picture of the Bible which uh, they did. So um, in by 1661, he first translated the New Testament. And as you can see, the picture of it. It looks something like this and also the old testament by 1663 so by 1663 he was able to translate the entire bible uh to uh massachusetts bay language uh, and, uh as we uh, saw earlier so by 1663 they were given with this publication in 75 so he continued to minister to people and uh, in 1675 there was a great war among the colonies of um, native uh, American Indians and the uh, Britishers and it was a huge uh, huge issue and a lot of people were killed and what happened uh, to Elliot's work was most copies of Elliot's Bible uh, were destroyed and uh, it was so sad that they all burned it uh, so so that it was not available to people anymore because um, when you try to understand the history um, so King Philip's war uh, is caused by the overpowering of the Britain over the native Indians. So because of the Puritan movement, they all had a, a strong tension among uh, the traditional uh, Christian belief and the movement. And uh, it also affected the war in a different, in a very difficult way that all the Bible copies were, most of the copies were destroyed. But Eliot began again and he pushed himself so hard that that second edition of his Bible got published in 1685, right? So that's, uh, uh, he did not stop at what uh, the challenges that he had, but he uh, was able to continue to do it and about to publish, and he was able to publish the second edition by 1685. Now, Eliot died in 1690, aged 85, and his last words being welcome joy. So he was a man of faith. He was a man of passion. He continued to minister to people uh, in different ways, mostly by translating. And another important thing which we could learn from his life is he was instrumental in uh, teaching people how to read so that they can understand from the word. Uh, and he impacted that society. I think, uh, that's all about uh, John Elliott. And thank you, Pastor Diana. Thank you. Thank you, John, for sharing in detail. And uh, you created a wonderful presentation to explain uh, about John Elliott. Thank you so much. So the next person we have in the list is Zeli Tully on George Fox and the Quakers. Zeli, are you ready? Yes, Pastor. Uh, yeah. Do you have a presentation? Yes, um, I try to prepare PPT. Like uh, my laptop is not working properly, but I try to do something new, which I've never done. I try to do it over my phone. And um, like, <laughs> it may be very slow because this Don't is the worry. first time I will be doing, but I'll try my best. Yeah. Sure, sure, sure. Don't worry, we can. Okay, uh, yeah. let me start. Yes. OK, 
Okay. So, um, are you all able to see the slides? Yes, we can see. It's clear. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk about George, uh, George Fox and the Quakers. Um, uh, about George Fox, uh, he was born uh, in the July 1624 in Drayton in the Clay, now Finnit Drayton, Leicestershire, England. Uh, he was a 17th century English preacher. He was a missionary and also the founder of the Society of Friends, commonly known as the Quakers or Friends Church. Uh, his parents were Christopher Fox and Mary Lego. Uh, he died in thir uh, 13th uh, January 1691 in London, England. Uh, his boss, uh, his boss, uh, her, uh, like his boss name was Margaret Fell Fox. Um, he published books on women speaking justified 1667 and the journals in 1694. Uh, one of his famous quotes, which I uh, really like, uh, is this one. Um, These things I do not see by the help of men nor by the latter, but I saw them in the light of the Lord Jesus Christ and by his immediate spirit and power and did the holy man of God by whom the holy scriptures were written, George Fox. Okay, so, so um, he was... Uh, you know, like uh, from early childhood, he has a religious disposition and, you know, he was saddened and confused by the careless moral conduct of the professed Christianity. So he left home and he traveled to London with several cl clergymen to seek inner peace, but he was unsuccessful. So he wrestled in the presence of God and he experienced the light of God within him eventually. And in 1647, he started preaching boldly to the people to ignore the ritualistic tradition of the church and to be converted with the power of the Holy Spirit, which, according to him, was the qualification for the ministry rather than the ecclesiastical uh, study. So here in the picture, we see him uh, preaching. Okay. So, like, as he started to preach boldly, you know, he was not welcomed by all and you know like he was thrown out of the church he was repeatedly beaten and he was imprisoned several times and so here in the picture we see uh, the, uh one of the quakers you know being persecuted you know and um as uh the number of people uh uh increase you know like uh uh people being converted through his preaching, the more the persecution intensified. And he also went uh, through a lot of uh, missionary journey. He traveled extensively to Europe, West Indies and the America preaching the word of God. Uh, George Fox final years, uh, like, uh, you know, he spent his final decade working in London to organize the Quaker movement. Uh, exhorting the Christian through his writing, you know, like George's journal, uh, Fox journal and the Mir uh, Book of Miracles are filled with accounts of miraculous healing and other charismatic gifts. And his famous convert was William Penn, who incorporated Quaker ethics into the fund in the colony of Pennsylvania in America. Here we see a picture of uh, William Penn here. And uh, the Quaker movement became one of the fastest growing movement in the Western world. And by 1656, uh, Fox has at least 56 associates who were traveling preachers. And by 1660, the, uh, the movement could boost of 40,000 to 60,000 at their hands. So I just want to share a little bit about who are the Quakers and what they believe, you know. The Quakers are member of the religious group, Society of Friends. Members are found throughout the world. Uh, there are varieties of group with varieties of belief, but a common set of belief may be attributed to the group as a whole. Um, these are their belief. You know, the first point is they believe in encountering God directly and personally, and also like they believe in cultivating spiritual life in the context of the community. And the third point is like uh, discerning God's will through the Bible and through other um, members of community. And the fourth point is living by faith according to the expression, let your life speak. 
So the Quakers, they are best known for their belief in the spiritual equality of all the people. This belief uh, translates into a practice that allows women as a greater role in the church organization, function and worship. Um, they are also known for their simple dress and opposition to social justice. Yeah, so that's my presentation. Thank you all. Thank you, Zeli. Everything went well. You explained well and you presented well. Thank you so much and God bless. Yeah, so next person in the list was uh, Enoch on Jonathan Edwards. Do we have Enoch in the class? Okay, Enoch is not there. Okay, we'll move on to the next person, George Whitefield by Subhashish. Subhashish, are you ready with your presentation? Yes, great. Uh, if you have a PPT, can you please present it and you can start? Sure. Thank you. Share your comments on the presentation of John Paul and Zeli Tholi. Let's give them a, um, you know, a hand of praise. Like, you know, they've really uh, researched on e on the a person assigned to them and they presented it well. They covered most of the points from each person. Thank you, John. Thank you, Zeli. Uh, good morning and praise the Lord to everyone. Uh, let me... Uh, can you all see my PPT? Yes, it's clear. Thank you. Uh, George Whitefield uh, actually born uh, on 27th uh, December 1714 and went to be with the Lord 30th September 1770. Uh, only 56 years actually he lived, but he did uh, amazing things. And he was a friend of Wesley's and he was a gifted preacher and also a powerful communicator. Uh, although he was an ordained Anglican clergyman, he was not denominationally prejudiced. In his school and college days, uh, White will experience a strong spiritual white awakening that he called a new birth, according to John uh, 3. He believed that every true religious person needs to experience a rebirth in Jesus. At Oxford, he became an intimate of the Methodist John and Charles Wesley, and at their, at their invitation, he joined them in their missionary work in the colony of Georgia in 1738. In 1739, he arrived in America, and what actually he did and what um, Made, uh, made us amazed that wherever he went, shopkeepers closed their doors, farmers left their plows, and workers threw, uh, threw down their tools to hurry to the place where he was to preach. And if it is happening these days, then definitely we'll be amazed. And that happened in 1739 uh, through George. Another amazing thing happened when the population of Boston was estimated at 20. 5,000 white will freeze to 30,000 on Boston Common. Maybe we can think about our city. If we are preaching, if our city population is 1 lakh, if people are hearing 1 lakh 50,000 or more than that, then how actually it will look like? And signs and wonders accompanied white will's preaching. Uh, white will is said to have preached 3,000 sermons on the same scripture passage of John 3.3. Only one passage, John 3, 3, and he prays 3,000 sermons. Uh, last slide, uh, maybe uh, we can uh, wonder to ourselves, we can question ourselves. Congregations are lifeless because dead men preach to them. Uh, it really uh, motivated my heart that uh, if many times we say our church is sleeping, our congregations are not growing in Christ, then we as leader, we as 
pastors, we can think how actually we are preaching. We can think about how our spiritual uh, life. So thank you so much. Over to Matthew. Thank you, Subhashish. Thank you for the presentation on George Whitefield. Thank you. Yeah, class, give your feedback about Subhashish's presentation and, you know, give him a applause on, on the project that he did, on the presentation that he presented. With that, we will move on to the next person, Lyndon. Lyndon, are you ready with your presentation on the Methodist revival in England and John Wesley? Lyndon? Lyndon, I see that your hand has been raised, but I... Okay, well, okay, you're asking for a minute. Sure, we'll wait. Okay. Oh. Okay. Okay, sure, you can figure out in that time. The next person uh, on David Bryant, Missionary to the North American Indians by Abu Bakr. Are you ready? Okay, Abu Bakr is not in the class for today. Do we have Elisha? Mm, okay, Aradhana. Okay. Okay. Okay, so we'll wait for Lyndon to fix his mic and log in again because none of the others have not logged in, maybe for some reason. Okay, is there anyone in the class? would like to add to what we heard upon, like, um, you know, uh, about uh, the person, John Elliott, that John shared. Like, is there any uh, anything from the class that you would like to add on about John Elliott, who was a missionary to the North, uh, Native North American Indians? Anything that you have heard about him, his ministry, his work? that has impacted the world, you all can add on it. I mean, we're just taking this time to share uh, till Lyndon joins back and that starts with this presentation. Or, you know, uh, like, uh, if not John Elliot or George Fox or whatever we have heard now in today's class about John Elliot, George Fox and the Quakers moment, or on George Whitefield and all the three of them. Is there anyone in the class that you would like to share an additional information about these three people that you have heard or read about them? Anyone from the class? Okay. Or what was your learning from these three people that we heard through from John Zellian? Subhashish, what was your 
take from these three people? How did their life story impact you personally? If there's anyone in the class that you would like to share, one or two points, it would be good. Yeah. Yes. Can I can I share? Yes. Yes, Mr. Isaac, please yes. go ahead. Thank you. I was just thinking about this, and uh, you asked. Um, one of the things, or two things, that really is impacted on this uh, presentation or the life of these reformers is the resilience, their desire, their enthusiasm, and the zeal that they got from every childhood. They learned so much and then dedicated their life. That sort of dedication, I think, is very, very necessary for us nowadays in ministry to be as committed to a cause. And I think uh, it's like the work of God, of course, but acceptance and to carry on like they did. Some against so many odds is so impressive. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Lyndon, are you ready with your presentation? Aradhana, are you ready with your presentation? On Henry Martin, missionary in India and Persia? Um, just one more minute, ma'am. Uh, I'm, I'm not done with my presentation, honestly, because I had an hectic week. Um, I was just preparing it uh, uh, right now. But I could only manage the first sheet. But uh, I, I think I can go with the pre uh, with uh, explaining John Wesley, and hopefully by end of the day, at least I hope so, that I will be able to finish the presentation and I will upload it in the uh, in the classroom. Yeah, if that's okay with you. Sure, sure, Lyndon, that should be okay. So you just put the first sheet, the presentation, and you can go ahead. You're not sharing about John Wesley and his ministry. Give me one more minute, ma'am. I'll try to connect sure. from the desktop. Yeah. Okay. Aradna, in the meanwhile, I would like to know if you're ready with your presentation. I'm sorry, ma'am. I'm not prepared. Okay. Um, yeah, request you. I will speak on Monday. Okay. 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 Okay, Aradna. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so anyone in the class uh, would like to share what impacted you from these three people on whom we discussed this morning? Uh, anyone that impa impacted you or inspired you, um, you know, from the life of John Elliot or George Fox or George Whitefield? Anyone from the class? Yeah, so I loved how. Uh, John Elliot, uh, I don't know whether John shared it, but it, I read in the internet uh, yesterday about John Elliot, quite some things just to know about him. And he was known as Apostles of the Indians. They gave him a title like that, and that was inspiring. And even, actually, he took a lot of steps uh, just to get people these Bibles. Uh, even when I shared about William Tyndall, uh, like how he translated Sometimes I wonder how hard these people have did many things. Actually, they have took a lot of risk, a lot of efforts, a lot of hard works just to get these Bibles in our hands. Today we have, I think, millions of translations, maybe like living translation, passion translations. But to have one Bible in their own language, to have one Bible they have, literally learned the language and then they start writing it with their own hand and then they are giving it to print and then how hard it is to see our own bible get burned right in front of us like we put all the efforts and it gets burned due to some uh, problems but still i love how they have the spirit like i'm not giving up i'm gonna do it again i'm gonna do it from the scratch i'm gonna do it with god the importance of word, uh, they are stressing it so much. Everyone we are learning about, every missionary, each and every one, how, how much importance they are giving to words. It really inspires me because we have so many Bibles at home. I think sometimes we are like, we'll read later, we'll read when we have time. You know? Sometimes we don't even read our Bible. Some days we get busy with the routine and something. But 
how important it is to go read it get deep knowledge about it uh, because it's a living word and one more reason that i'm learning recently through all these missionaries is that they have given their whole life to translate it so that importance we should also have that burning desire with us and they're really inspiring i love their never giving up spirit actually no matter what happens they are like let's do it again with god let's do it again from the start from the scratch let's do it again so yeah we should have that spirit no matter what happens like i want to do this for god with god for his glory so i re- i'm really getting inspired and thanks for each and every one of my classmates who are sharing things so amazing thank you thank you jeffina thank you for sharing um is there anyone else yeah, yeah, yes linda you can okay please go ahead okay uh please let me know if you could see my screen Yes, we can see the screen. Okay, uh, I sincerely apologize. Uh, I could uh, had an hectic week, so I could not complete the the PPT as much as I would have thought. Uh, but anyways, uh, good morning, all. Uh, I'm, I'm Lyndon Philip Martin. So uh, I've prepared this uh, presentation, uh, at least a, a document for now, about uh, John Wesley. And the topic given me was John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist Church. Okay, so. Uh, throughout this uh, subject we've been talking about a lot of uh, preachers or a lot of uh, revolutionists who had a zeal uh, for god for revival and to spread the gospel and they they share the same goal which is to spread the gospel or they had a deep uh, admiration of what people are going through and if if they are in sin or bondage you now let the gospel be spread and let the good news be spread to them and uh, one such uh, person who he was no different from all the other uh, uh, theologians if i can say so was uh, john wesley and talking talking about john wesley he lived almost the 17th century he was born in the year uh, 1703 and uh, lived uh, until 1791 and John Wesley was brought up in a Christian uh, family. Uh, so his parents were all uh, into uh, you know, church ministry. And uh, I, I believe they were into Anglican background. And um, they, they were all uh, religious, traditional Christians, no questions about it. And they were brought up in a way that you know they honored God. They wanted to serve God in uh, whatever capacity is possible. And John Wesley and his brother Charles Wesley were also uh, no different, and you know they served uh, the God with the zeal, and they you know they, uh, they they were in active positions with the church they attended, and uh, and as they were brought up uh, somewhere in the year uh, seventeen twenty five or so, uh, you know. John Wesley decides to you know, travel all the way to Georgia in the United States to share the gospel to the native uh, Indians there. And uh, for some reasons, you know, he, he, he could not succeed because you know the, the faith that they had, both John and Charles Wesley were quite different or something. In, in, in other words, it were, wasn't uh, appreciated as much as John Wesley would have uh, expected by the native Indians back in Georgia. So it was a failed missionary trip and they had to come back and uh, it, it wasn't a, a failure by all means because you know that that uh, made John Wesley to think and you know to wait upon the Lord and uh, to have even more faith like uh, what the Moravians did. Moravians is uh, I, I guess it's, it's another Christian denomination which was very active uh, at, back in that time and um, 
he, he, he get to he got to read about the Martin Luther's documents and he waited on the Lord and uh, somewhere you know and at that particular time Charles Finney was uh, active at the Oxford School and he was having a small uh, prayer group and a few other young men who were also actively participated who had the same uh, stirring in their heart to you know, do something for Christ, to spread the gospel, to wait upon the Lord and to, I mean, th those were a, a spiritual group and the difference between them and the rest of the Christians at that point point in time was, you know, they, they had strict disciplines, they had strict uh, regiments that they followed. And that's one of the main reason that group was called a Methodist because of their, you know, strict rules, doctrines and uh, you know, the regiments that they followed very strictly. And uh, at one point in time, John Wesley was made the head of that uh, group. And, you know, people started mocking that group and they also called it a holy group uh, or holy society, holy club. Uh, and and um, I, I told you earlier that uh, John Wesley was part of this Anglican church. But, uh, you know, after the Georgia uh, missionary field trip, he, you know, he, he, he began following uh, the, the Moravian uh, 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 prayer or Moravian uh, groups uh, or the Mor Moravian uh, approach, uh, and and uh, they uh, met in a certain place called uh, the Fetters Lane. Uh, th there was this uh, Fetter Lane Society, which was uh, established back in England by the Moravians. And it was uh, on a New Year Eve uh, back in 1738 that uh, John Wesley, Charles, and a few other uh, Englishmen, they all, uh, you know, joined. And it, it's a normal or it's, it's part of the culture there to have a fellowship, you have a dinner on the New Year Eve. And after which, uh, you know, these uh, uh, young men or, uh, you know, the people who are part of this uh, uh, holy club as they say it so uh, so they continued to wait upon the lord and you know because of the zeal they had they wanted to you know uh, wanted god to you know consecrate give them more faith uh, and you uh, know as they waited uh, further in the presence of god somewhere around 3 a.m as they say so that you know there was a mighty outpour of the holy spirit and you know approximately there were 60 odd people in the federal lanes uh, you know uh, at the federal lane society which was at the number 30 Fetter Lane in London, as they say, it's 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 historic. The the name of that society and the street itself, because you know uh, people or the traditionalists believe that that's where the revival started, and uh, uh, very similar to what happened at the day of Pentecost, where there were one twenty odd people here uh, in 1738, December 31st, or the New Year 1731. Uh, three in the morning, uh, there was a mighty outpour of the Holy Spirit, and uh, people were, you know, rejoicing. You know, they were overjoyed by the presence of the Holy Spirit, and um, it was a wonderful experience for them. And 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 that particular experience changed uh, the whole look of the Christianity or evangelism from there on. So because it's, it's, it's been told that at that particular point in time, back in England, where every sixth house in a street uh, was like a mini bar or something where, you know, people go out uh, for uh, cheap drinks and, you know, drugs and, you know, all those, those sort of things where the, the, the when it was uh, literally a criminal injustice happening, and um, those were those were some some of the reasons why uh, jo uh, you know, John Wesley and Charles Wesley were very much focused about spreading the gospel. And uh, I, I told earlier the you know they went to Georgia and the, the missionary trip failed, uh, not as much as they would have expected. It did not go as much as they would have expected. However, it was not a complete failure. Why? Because um, after uh, 
the revival, the so-called revival as we call it now, uh, back in after 1739, uh, John Wesley, his brother, and you know, I, I think we are yet to hear about John Whitefield. I'm not sure, but you know, all, all these people of God, uh, you know, the, the, these young men, they started evangelizing, spreading the gospel from op I mean, in the open fields, like wherever possible, wherever people gathered. And that, that was something new for uh, you know, the people back uh, at that particular point in time. And there were lots and lots of people uh, being evangelized and you know, they heard the good news and you know, they were saved. And um, uh, uh, something uh, peculiar about uh, John Wesley was that it's, it's not just about uh, spreading the gospel, it's, it's also about helping those in need. Okay, and uh, increase the faith, increase, uh, you know, uh, in, or, you know, help, uh, help the, the believers to grow in faith and, you know, to have authority over scriptures. I told earlier that, you know, uh, John Wesley and uh, Charles Wesley, the brothers, were brought up in a Christian family and they, the parents also held high positions in the church and because of which they, you know, got to learn the Hebrew and the Latin, uh, no, and and th that made them grow strong, uh, uh, biblically, theologically, and uh, uh, alongside their their missionary work, where they happen to, you know, bestow on the fellow believers as well about what uh, you know the, the authority that they have over the scriptures, and you know to help people grow in faith and slowly. And uh, as, as time progressed, lots and lots of people started uh, to, you know, follow these uh, doctrines. And, you know, uh, I mean, there is still, uh, a, I mean, I, I think it, it can still be a debate about when this Methodist movement started, because I've read some documents where it said um, John Wesley did not intend to start the Methodist movement and he was part of the Anglican clergy. I mean, as long as he was alive or as long as the, the church congregation that he was part of till his last breath, it seemed, I mean, they say he's part of the Anglican church, but some say, uh, you know, as uh, you know, he started evangelizing and as the uh, gospel was spread um, across uh, UK and other parts of the nation, uh, you know, people started forming this group called Methodist. So that's something uh, to be argued, but let's not get in there for now. But uh, apart from uh, his, his open field uh, missionary work, he traveled a lot. He, it, it seems he had shared more than 40,000 sermons. He has traveled to several miles across geographies to spread the gospel. And he has spent a good fortune of money for the spreading of gospel as, as well, it seems. But uh, the, the important thing here, what I stress or what we would want to learn from uh, John Wesley's life is uh, to, to wait upon the Lord. Now, we, we talk about revival. We know we live in the end of days uh, where, you know, where we know where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. But um, for people who seek uh, a genuine move of God or people who who are looking for a revival, we need to understand that there, there are micro revivals that uh, will precede the uh, ma macro revivals. Yeah. So wh what I mean by that, okay, revivals start with individuals, with, uh, you know, with the, the, the ch with God's uh, church, and then it moves forward. So um, it, it's it's our responsibility that as uh, uh, as Christians, as being born again, that we need to wait upon the Lord, you know, sanctify ourselves, and you know, wait for God, uh, wait for the Holy Spirit's downpour, so that you know we could uh, make a change in the society. Now, what happened after 1970? 1939, after uh, the, the the revival, as we say now, was you know there were a lot of changes that happened in in the in the Fetters Lane, uh, in the Fetter Street, and you know thereabouts where you know the the, the criminal injustice uh, uh, what was was not there, as they say, as they claim. 
uh, and you know people were not committing as much sin and you know the, the police had no records of you know uh, any criminal activities um, at, at that particular point in time and uh, yeah yeah I, I, it it was uh, you know a, a peaceful period uh, even though if it was for a brief period of time it was a peaceful period of, and and uh, you know a lot of people came into christ so now uh, as we uh, who are listening to this uh, presentation i urge people to you know wait upon the lord you know follow small uh, small groups of like minded like visioned uh, you know who share the same zeal uh, to you know, wait as we you know hope for the revival to happen. Wait in the presence of Lord. Empower yourself, and uh, you know, let's make a change to this world. And uh, look, we, we bring a lot of uh, we bring glory to the kingdom of God. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Lyndon, uh, for sharing on the Methodist moment. about how John Wesley and Charles Wesley were involved in bringing up the Methodist revival into England. Thank you so much. And yeah, the class, you can go and give your comments on the chat and encourage Lyndon. OK, so Thanks. with that, we also see Precy and Laya Lama in the group. Request you all to please stay online just give me a minute while i share this so you all can take your topics make a note and next class you can present it okay bracy can you present on the campus lang revival in scotland about william mcclough and laya lama on henry martin who was a missionary in india and persia and paul ivatu are you still online paul yeah Paul, even though if you can present yes, yes. on, yeah, if you can present and Robert Morrison, first pro Protestant missionary in China. So all you three guys, can you all please confirm if you all have got your topics? I cannot present now. Maybe next time. No, no, not this class. In the next on next class, that is on Monday. Would that be okay, okay Paul? Okay. Monday, right? And how about Tracy okay. and Laya? Tracy and Laya Lama? Okay, I don't. Okay, Tracy is there. Laya Lama is there. Okay, uh, please do write to me and let me know if y'all got the topics and y'all can present it on Monday. Okay, thank you so much. Um, God bless each one of you all through the week and see you all next week on Monday. God bless. Thank you.